Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode in this tutorial series showing how to build a simple balsa wood discus launch glider. As you may recall, the aircraft we're building in this series is a simplified version of the one you see here. In the previous episode, we saw how to construct the tail surfaces. In this episode, we'll see how to attach the tail surfaces to the fuselage, and how to install the pull cables to bring the spring and string linkage to functionality. You'll want to have handy all the other tools and materials used in previous episodes. That said, however, let's take a look at some staple items anyway. Of course, you'll need your medium viscosity CA glue, along with your CA accelerant, for which I'm using Bob Smith Industries. You'll also need your knife and your pen, of course, for doing all the marking out and all the cutting. And in this case, you'll need some thread and scissors to make the pull cables. You'll also need a long, thin piece of some sort of material. It could be wire, but in this case, I'm using one millimeter carbon fiber. Then you'll need your electronics, 180mAh 1S LiPo battery, a battery to JSD adapter, 4 channel MNRX receiver, and a bind plug. Then of course you'll need your transmitter, for which I'm using my trusty DX8. Now while other odds and ends may be needed along the way, that about sums up your tools and materials. Let's now get right into the build process. You'll first take those tail surfaces we made in the previous episode, and line them up underneath the tail boom as if they were to be glued there. You'll then take your pen, and make a mark along the tail boom right where the horizontal stabilizer mount ends. You can also use a lighter, thicker marker if the pen doesn't show up well on the black carbon fiber, as it often doesn't. This marks approximately the position of the hole you'll be cutting to allow the elevator control cable to come out of the tail boom. Having found the mark satisfactorily accurate, we'll now put a piece of scrap wood down to protect our table, and use a foam sanding block to scuff up the area around the mark we've made on the tail boom. We'll then change the orientation of the fuselage such that we can sand the side of the tail boom, as that is where we'll cut the hole for the elevator control cable. As you see, I've now switched to a rougher sandpaper such that I can sand a little divot right where I plan to cut the hole in order to give my knife more purchase. Having done that, I'll now take my X-Acto knife with a nice new sharp blade and simply cut the hole in the prepared spot. Now the foregoing processes will create a lot of this carbon fiber dust, which is very unhealthy to breathe in. So take a piece of packing tape and stick it to all that dust to pick it all up and get it out of there. Fold the tape in half and throw it away. Our next step is to install the vertical stabilizer. First off, it's clear to see that we'll have to sand a small divot into the vertical stabilizer right where it's supposed to meet the tail boom, such that the two curves meet flush. As you can see, I'm doing that here with some rough sandpaper. And done. Now, as you can clearly see, the curve of the tail boom and the curve of the sanded portion fit. In gluing on the vertical stabilizer, it's imperative that it's glued on, well, vertically. So to do that, we'll use a set of three 90 degree angle jigs, which stand on the table as you can see here. The pair I've got in my hand now, I'm going to set up under both wingtips such that the airframe is level. I'll next take any old object to support the nose at a given height. In this case, I'm using a roll of masking tape. Then I'll use my third jig to make sure that I install the vertical stabilizer at 90 degrees to my table. If the airframe is level, and the vertical stabilizer is perpendicular to that, then it therefore must be vertical. I'll then complete a somewhat similar process for the horizontal stabilizer. The only difference in this case is that I will not use any jigs to install it, I'll simply eyeball it. At this point, I've got four reference points, the fuselage, the wings, and the vertical stabilizer, which is plenty to make sure I get it within a couple of degrees. Good enough for my purposes. We now change camera angles to get a better idea of the following steps. We'll first get a little bit of CA accelerant in our dropper such that we can use it in various steps following. We'll then use some CA glue to attach the end of our nylon thread to the end of our carbon fiber rod. In your case, it might be a wire rod or some other kind of long flexi material, no matter. As you see, I'm wrapping it around a few times, applying some accelerant, and then cutting off the excess thread. I'm now unraveling my long carbon fiber rod such that I can use it to pull this thread through the tail boom. As you can see, I'm doing that now. As you can see, I'm careful to push the carbon fiber rod through with many slow and short motions, just to make sure I don't somehow unbeknownstly impale the other end of the fuselage with the rod. Now that I've successfully pulled the thread all the way through the tail boom using the carbon fiber rod, I'll tape it down with a little piece of masking tape such that the rod doesn't snake around the table while I'm trying to work with it. I'll then put a paper towel down underneath where the carbon fiber rod and the thread meet in preparation for some gluing. I'll then take my scrap balsa and cutting off a small section, I'll glue it to the thread such that it acts as a limiter and disables the thread from slipping back through the tail boom. 
I'll then cut away the carbon fiber rod as it's no longer needed for this step. I'll then attach a similar limiter to the other end of the thread to make sure it can't slip back through the tail boom either. I'll then cut away the spool of thread, which will then also no longer be necessary. Two limiters are actually not really necessary, but it's sort of an idealistic precaution, which I figured I'd show in this tutorial. I'll now orient the airframe such that I can work with the front end of the thread. I'll then cut off that limiter as I'm working with the thread now, so there's no chance of it accidentally slipping back through the tail boom. Then I'll wrap it twice around the outermost hole in the servo arm, as you can see I've done here. I'll now put down a paper towel and use a little dab of CA glue to affix the thread to the servo arm. It's now time to bind your transmitter to the receiver. I've already done this, but if you haven't and don't know how, you can refer to one of the many transmitter-receiver binding tutorials which exist on YouTube. I'll now plug my servos into their respective plugs on the receiver and test that I have functionality in the servo in question. Once you've done this, keep your transmitter and receiver powered on during the next couple of steps because that servo will have to remain centered. You'll now go to the aft end of the pull cable and you'll cut off that limiter that you put on earlier. Then, you'll take the end of the thread and you'll wrap it around the control horn twice, similarly to how you wrap it around the servo arm twice. Using a sizable piece of masking tape, you'll then tape the rudder in place such that it's deflected, pushing against the spring. In my case, that constitutes right deflection, but if you've put your rudder on the right side of your tail boom, that would be left deflection. You'll now make sure the pull cable is pulled tight all around. Remember that little areas of slack such as between the tail boom and the control horn, or in the individual wrappings around the control horn, can easily go unnoticed and can lead to some wonkiness in the control responsiveness later on. So make sure it's tight everywhere throughout the entire linkage from servo to control horn. Also remember that the sharp edge of your metal control horn can fray or cut your control line. So don't pull too tightly right at the control horn. Instead, isolate the individual loops of thread you've wrapped around the control horn and tighten them each individually similar to how you might tighten up a double knot on a shoelace. If you've tightened the pull cable all the way, you should be able to remove that masking tape and the deflection ought to hold. You can then take your CA glue and put a little dab on the control horn to hold that pull cable in place. Then you can check the servo deflection with your transmitter and find that, indeed, the linkage works and the rudder moves both left and right. It looks to be very little deflection, but fear not! These low dihedral, high aspect ratio designs tend to need very little deflection for very high maneuverability. Having successfully gotten the rudder to actuate, we'll now move on to do the same thing for the elevator. I suppose it is kind of boring just to see me doing it all over again. If you want to pause and look at certain bits again, I guess you can do that. Oh, now we're fading. Oh, okay, hey look, both tail services actuate now. Isn't that wonderful? Simple as that. Magic of editing. What did it take? 30 seconds? Great. And as you can see here, we've played a little game of Tetris and gotten all the wires to fit in the pod up in the nose. They do fit, they fit quite well, as it's designed to fit those specific electronics, but it is quite a game of Tetris nonetheless. Now for our final step, we'll reinstall that hatch that we made a few episodes ago using a bit of packing tape to attach it to the main section of the fuselage. I had to deinstall it such that I could access the servos properly to hook up the pull cables. We'll then use a bit of masking tape as a temporary hold down for the nose end of the hatch, which I always find works best. Having done that, we'll find ourselves to have a finished balsa wood discus launch glider. Well, that sums it up for the proper tutorial part of this series. I hope you found these tutorial videos somehow insightful, helpful, entertaining, or all three. Join me in the next episode in which we'll go over how to make the aircraft fly best and how to understand the flight characteristics of discus launch gliders. As always, thanks for watching!